Hi, good day everyone. With me again, Lady Triali in introductory macroeconomics class. So far, we have learned about the tools that economists use to analyze the behavior of the economy as a whole and the impact of policies on the economy. Nevertheless, economists have long debated certain macroeconomic policies. Here are the examples of such policies. Hopefully, this video helps you choose a side in these debates or at least helps you see why choosing a side is so difficult. The first debate is about whether policymakers should try to stabilize the economy or not. We have learned how monetary and fiscal policy can shift aggregate demand and influence the short-run fluctuation in an economy. Based on this, those who advocate to smooth the ups and downs of the business cycle believe that when aggregate demand is inadequate to ensure full employment, such as at point B, policymakers should boost government spending, cut taxes, and expand the money supply. When aggregate demand is excessive like at point C, on the other hand, risking higher inflation, policymakers should cut government spending, raise taxes, and reduce demand supply. However, those who are against the policies argue that monetary and fiscal policy can be used to stabilize the economy in theory, but in practice, they are working with a long leg. Change in monetary policy, for example, have little effect on aggregate demand until about six months after the change is made. It happens because the resulting interest rate from the change in monetary policy is not responded immediately by households and firms who usually set their spending plans in advance. Fiscal policy also works with lag because the long political process that governs changes in spending and taxes. It may take months or even years to propose, pass, and implement a major change in fiscal policy. Because of these long legs, policymakers who want to stabilize the economy need to look ahead to economic conditions. But unfortunately, according to many studies, economic forecasting is highly imprecise. As a result, policymakers can inadvertently exacerbate rather than mitigate the magnitude of economic fluctuation. Therefore, according to them, economic policymakers should refrain from intervening often with monetary and fiscal policy and be content if they do no harm. Now, even when policymakers agree to implement the stabilization policies, there still has been debates about which policy tool is better and more effective. When tools of monetary policy lose their effectiveness, maybe because of the zero interest rate policy or because the interest rate cannot be set any lower, fiscal policy is the option. But there is a question whether policymakers should fight recession with spending hikes or with tax cuts. According to the proponents of the spending hikes, increases in government purchases are a more potent tool than decreases in taxes. When households get extra disposable income from a tax cut, they will likely save some of the additional income rather than spend it all, especially if households view the tax deduction as temporary rather than permanent. By contrast, when the government spends more, the spending immediately and fully adds to aggregate demand. Remember the multiplier FX. With the same amount of net government spending and of taxes, the government spending multiplier is thought to be higher than the tax multiplier. In spite of the seemingly lower multiplier FX, the advocates of tax cuts policy think that the tools instead are more powerful than spending hikes. Tax cuts can increase aggregate demand by altering incentives such as the tax deduction in the form of expanded investment tax credit that induce increased spending on investment goods. Tax cuts can also increase aggregate demand by increasing household disposable income, as emphasized in traditional Keynesian analysis. Moreover, tax cuts can increase aggregate supply. When the government reduces marginal tax rates, the unemployed workers have a greater incentive to search for jobs, and the employed workers have a greater incentive to work longer hours. Increased aggregate supply along with the increased aggregate demand means that the production of goods and services can expand without putting upward pressure on the rate of inflation. The advocates of tax cuts policy also raise some issues in increasing government spending during recession. First. Anticipating the higher tax in the future because of the spending hikes, consumers may cut back spending today and save more. Second, with future taxes that likely distort future economy, 
firms may also reduce their expectation of future profits and reduce investment spending today. Because of these two possibilities, government spending multipliers may be smaller than is conventionally believed. Lastly, it is far from clear whether the government can spend money both wisely and quickly. During recession that need for immediate demand, if the government increases spending quickly, it may end up buying things of little public value. But if it tries to be careful and deliberate in planning its expenditure, it may fail to increase aggregate demand in a timely fashion. Let's turn our attention now on monetary policy to stabilize the economy. The first issue is whether the monetary policy should be made by rule or by discretion. Those who advocate monetary policy by rule think that discretional monetary policy does not limit incompetence and abuse of power of the monetary authority. One example of the abuse power is that central bankers are sometimes tempted to use monetary policy to affect the outcome of election. Moreover, discretional policy may result in time inconsistency or discrepancy between announcement of what policymakers say they are going to do and actions of what they subsequently in fact do. Higher expectations of inflation because of this discrepancy shift the short-run Phillips curve upward, making the short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment less favorable. Committing the monetary authority to policy rules such as inflation targeting law or law of targeting the growth of money supply is perceived to be able to eliminate incompetence and abuse of power of the monetary authority, make the political business cycle impossible, and make the policy more time consistent. In response to the argument made by the proponents of monetary policy by rule, the proponents of monetary policy by discretion emphasizes the importance of flexibility offered by the discretional policy. When there is a shock to the economy, for example, a designer of a policy rule could not possibly consider all the contingencies and specify in advance the right policy response. They also argue that both political business cycle and time inconsistency problem are far from clear. Interest rate could rise significantly during one election year, but it could also decline during another election year. The experience also shows that low inflation does not always require that the monetary authority be committed to uh, policy rules. The second issue on monetary policy is whether the monetary authority aim for zero inflation or not. The advocates, of course, stress out the cost of inflation that can be substantial even during periods of uh, moderate inflation. They think that public for sure dislike inflation. Reducing inflation is also thought to cause temporary disinflationary recession costs, but offer permanent benefits. If the monetary authority announces a credible commitment to zero inflation, it can directly influence expectation of inflation and even reduce the disinflationary cost substantially. Moreover, zero inflation target is the only number for the inflation rate at which the monetary authority can claim that it has achieved price stability and fully eliminated the cost of inflation. The critics, however, suggest that the costs of reaching zero inflation in fact are large, especially if the existing rate is far from zero. A disinflationary recession can potentially leave permanent scars on the economy. And then, Despite the cost of inflation, living standards of people in fact depend on productivity, not monetary policy. Reducing inflation would not cause real incomes to rise more rapidly. Policymakers can also reduce many of the costs without actually reducing inflation. Furthermore, a little bit of inflation may even be a good thing that makes real wages adjust easier, for example, or to stimulate the economy with a negative real interest rate. The next macroeconomic policy debate is whether a government should balance the budget or not. The advocates of the policy argue that budget deficits impose an unjustifiable burden on future generations by raising their taxes and lowering their incomes. Even though during war or during a temporary downturn in economic activity, budget deficit policy is justifiable, but it is unsustainable. Return to a balanced budget would mean greater national saving, increased capital accumulation, 
and faster economic growth. Critics of a balanced government budget argue that the deficit is only one small piece of fiscal policy. Single-minded concern about the budget deficit can obscure the many ways in which a policy, including various spending programs, affect different generations. Reducing deficits by cutting spending on public investment, such as education for instance, may cause lower debt for the younger generation, but it doesn't make them better off because they are less educated. The last debate that I would like to explain is about the tax laws, whether they need to be reformed or not to encourage saving. Advocates of tax incentives for saving point out that society discourages saving in many ways, such as by heavily taxing capital income and by reducing benefits for those who have uh, accumulated wealth. They endorse reforming the tax law to encourage saving, perhaps by switching from an income tax to a consumption tax. Critics of tax incentives for saving, however, argue that many proposed changes to stimulate saving would primarily benefit the wealthy who do not need a tax break. They also argue that such changes might have only a small effect on private saving. Raising public saving by reducing the government's budget deficit would provide a more direct and equitable way to increase national saving. Okay, that's the end of my explanation. Hopefully it helps you understand more about the perspectives of macroeconomic policies in practice and may give you insight as well to deal with the issues. Thank you for your attention.